I could not be more excited because of the people that I'm standing in front of right now. So good morning, everyone. Good morning to those of you online as well. And it's going to be a fantastic Sunday. You know, uh, Impact Sunday for us is an opportunity to really advance the kingdom of God in our lives and in the lives of, of others. I couldn't be more excited about uh, where we are and what we're doing. And uh, city will never be the same. Amen. Where we live, the city will never be the same. Amen. And so today I want to I minister a message to you today. And I, I, I'm just calling it, come and help us. And it's a scripture that I found in, in Acts chapter number 16. And it's the, the travels, if you will, of the Apostle Paul. And he's got a great testimony. We'll talk a great deal about him today. But in this kingdom series, we've really been talking about the fact that God has identified with us so that we could identify with him. And that ultimately, he changes who we are and changes the direction of our lives in such a powerful way that, you know, thank God Jesus is not just a self-help self section in a bookstore. How many of you know he's much more than that? He loves to help you, but he, in helping you, you become contagious with that very same thing. You know, the Apostle Paul, the Bible says that in chapter 16, verse number 6, it says, Now when he had gone through Phrygia, the region of Galatia, which, by the way, is the region of Turkey, if you want to know what it looks like on a modern map, in the area of Galatia, that they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word of God in Asia. Now, Asia Minor is where they've been the entire time. And so... Across the Aegean Sea, that's when you get into Europe. And so the, the Bible says that after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of God did not permit them. And so Bithynia, remember that city because it's important. And so passing through Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A, Mas a man from Macedonia stood, and he pleaded with him, saying, come and help us. Come over to Macedonia and help us. And now after that, he had seen this vision. Immediately, they sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel to them. What a powerful story. You know, the, the Apostle Paul is a tremendous guy, and a guy with a great experience in God. And this guy was, he, he, the, the gospel needs to be preached in many places, then as well as now. How many of you know this is a target-rich environment for people that need breakthrough? in their lives. Maybe you're here today and you need a real touch from God, a miracle of breakthrough in your life. And I just want you to know you came to the right place. It's not because we're something special, but because God's always special and he's always available. And so in this generation, we need breakthrough. And awareness of the needs that you and I have today in the day in which we live, not only in our own lives, but in, in the community that we're in, the dangers of our society, the desperation has never been so clear. And so thinking strategically that there are some obvious places to plant churches, strategic places. Well, the Apostle Paul had that, that kind of a mindset. You talk about a guy that was on a mission. He received that call from God, and, and he was a brilliant man with his own testimony. And Paul's testimony that here he is persecuting the church. His name is Saul of Tarsus. And you'll find that, that after the death of Stephen, that he goes on a rampage persecuting beautiful church people, people of, that are following Jesus. And now he's putting them in jail and disrupting the whole flow of, of life on a religious mission to, to, to stamp out this fire of revival through the, the Nazarene sect. And so here, here he is, he's persecuting the church on the road to Damascus, has an encounter with Jesus, boom, down he goes, God says, Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord, that I would persecute you? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Jesus takes it personal when you mess with his kids. Blinders came on his eyes. He goes to a street called Straight in Damascus, and suddenly God speaks to a guy named Ananias. Ananias, minding his own business, just having a great day. Suddenly, Jesus appears to Ananias and say, you need to go talk to a terrorist about me. <laughs> How many of you know God will ask you to do some tough stuff sometimes? As a matter of fact, I think he's going to be asking you to cross some boundaries today, just like he did Ananias. Ananias put up a, a bit of a fuss about it. 
And he ended up going, and he lays hands on Saul of Tarsus. God's spoken to him by then. By then, he's become a convert. He said yes to Jesus. Blinders still on his eyes. He lays his hands on him. Blinders come off, and he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Boom, all of a sudden, launches into the world and world history and the proliferation of the church of Jesus Christ through a guy named Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul, ends up writing half of the New Testament. It's amazing that this great, this great missionary had his own experience of transformation. And because of the changed life, I suppose he's through that experience saying, listen, if God can change me from where I was, he could do it for anyone. And so now his whole life is spent looking for Jesus encounters for anyone who will listen. Because they can all have one. That the gospel, he, Paul says himself in 1 Corinthians, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. And so his objective, what he told King Agrippa in chapter 20, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision. That God gave him a vision and he said, I've been after it ever since, all the way to here. Paul wanted to make an impact in places like Bithynia. Now, Bithynia is a, trade of, it's a port of trade. It's a place where economic con commerce, influence, and all the things that kind of come with that, it's Bithynia. And if ever there was a place to start a church, Paul's thinking, man, I'm going right there. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not going to go there. He says, the Holy Spirit forbid me to go there. And so that night he has a dream and it's a dream of a Macedonian saying, come and help us. And immediately they, they said, the Spirit of God sent us a new direction, and we're going to take a trip across the Aegean Sea over into Europe. And that one logistic decision to take the gospel into a place called Macedonia brought the gospel to Europe, and it changed world history and culture for 2,000 years. That one dream and a guy willing to take, take a night's sleep, Hear from God and change direction. Culture in the West changed because a guy had a good night's sleep. And it's heard from God and it's changed the world around us. Influenced the world for, for thousands of years. What was it? Come, I need your help. And that was the word. I need your help. People need help. We need help. How many of you know we all need help? Help. We need somebody. I'm sorry. Had a Beatles moment there. <laughs> Paul missed the Messiah for years, and he was right in front of him, and he missed it. He became in opposition to that, and suddenly the fire that hit him when he realized the one he was persecuting was his Savior forever. Yeah. And the one that I'd read about Messiah was him all along. And so it's important for us to really grasp the idea that God wants to help people, and he's helped people just like us. Come on, how many of you are thankful that God found you wherever you were? You may have grown up in church, or you may have never been to church before today, but I want you to realize, even those of you online, that today God has a great plan for your life. Don't miss it, because you can be distracted, miss it, or take the religious version of Jesus instead of the real one. I just want you to know there are people all over this world that are desperate for help, and it's found in Jesus. People don't know what they're asking for sometimes. They look for it in all kinds of relationships, and some of them uh, looking for it in drugs or alcohol, or some of them are just floundered with the idea of, I'll just stay busy in life, and before you know it, you look over your shoulder, and 40 years are gone. And you say, what was it all about? It could be those kind of things. And again, people need help. They don't even know how to ask for it at this point. And so we have to see the redemptive possibilities in the moment that we're in. I can just tell you that 20 and 21 of, of the last two years for us, how many of you know there's been some trials and tests in the way for all of us? But it's not time to buy tribulation food and go to a bomb shelter. Come on, I need somebody to say a good amen. amen. Not time for hiding, it's time for reaching. Why? Because people, people have never known how much they needed the Lord until the last year and a half. And it's, and it's the kingdom builders, it's people like us who understand the times and the seasons that we're living in and we're willing to say, yeah, let's step forward. Let's, let's move into this. What can God do? I'm God has forgiven us so much. Think about your own gnarly past. 
of all that God has done for you. And, and just think if that answer became available and apparent to the people that we, we're going to reach, our neighbors and our friends and, and so forth. And man, I, I'm telling you, the, the time is now. I, I can remember all the different people in, in my life that, you know, mom and dad used to sick people on me all the time. <laughs> friends to come talk to me about Jesus and so forth. And I don't think I rolled my eyes at him. At least on the inside, I was probably rolling my eyes, but maybe I was nice to him on the outside. A guy named Bill Licklider, a youth pastor, invited me to lunch and so forth and started talking to me about Jesus and so forth. And little by little, I got more and more of the story until a hippie named Mike Warnke that a mom and mom and dad probably considered that going to a comedy show would probably be appealing to me, and it was. I laughed my way all the way to Jesus. And my life transformed. Everything changed. Because God takes people like I was and turns them into people that are righteous, people that are mission-oriented to, to see if God can do it for me like he did for the Apostle Paul, he can do it for anyone. You know, there was a woman in, in Luke chapter number 7. Jesus had gone to a, a, a Pharisee, a religious ruler's house. And n normally they were kind of interrogating him. They were impressed with the miracles but took exception where, wherever it didn't fit into the law understanding that they had. And so they would generally interrogate him. And in the midst of their discussion, all of a sudden in the door walks a woman unannounced. She comes in. She's weeping. And she weeps over his feet until she's washing his feet with the tears that falls from her cheeks. And then she anoints him. And they're all looking at her, at, at Jesus like, if you're a prophet, surely you know what kind of a woman this was. And Jesus gives them this great story. And he says that there was a creditor and two debtors owed him 500 denarii and 50 denarii. And the creditor forgave both of them their debts. And this is Jesus' question. Which one loved him, the creditor, more for the forgiveness? And the Pharisees said rightfully, the one that they forgave them, he forgave the most. And said, when I came into your house, you didn't wash my feet, but she's washed her feet with the tears of her eyes. And you didn't anoint my head, but she's anointed me with her tears. And this is what he said, he that's forgiven much loves much. He that's forgiven little loves little. And that was the expression, and that's the idea that, that I believe that all of us need to come to. The fact that, that if you've done horrible things, God is still a forgiving God. And no matter where you've been, you might not... Matter of fact, I had somebody say the hardest forgiveness that I've ever tried to get is forgiving myself. Just yesterday, somebody told me that. I said, well, get used to the idea because you are forgiven. And I just want you to understand today that the world is crying out for, a, for not a critical point the finger at that woman from the city, that, that city woman. That's what they called her, that woman of the city who's a sinner. Okay, well, join the club because we're all sinners in need of a savior. Matter of fact, every time that God needs to, to raise up somebody, it's generally somebody with a testimony. Do you know the first person that saw Jesus raised from the dead was a gal named Mary Magdalene? And she didn't start off too great. When Jesus met her, she had seven demons. It's a bad day when you got one. <laughs> this gal's got seven, man. Freedom comes to this gal. Transformation takes place. And all of a sudden, she's testifying of the resurrection of Jesus before anyone else on the planet. Wow, what could God do with people like us? Imagine. In Acts chapter number 6, the Bible says that the church was blowing and going. I mean, the day of Pentecost came, 3,000 people getting saved, communities being built. They're continuing every day in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread, prayer. The Bible says they gave uh, their goods, had all things come. In other words, if you got a need, I got, a, I got supply. Let's, let's just make this thing work together. And it's just like never before. The kingdom of God just looked magnificent. And here's this, this, they're trying to work their way through the management issues, and, and there's, a, there's a problem that arises among them. They, they're given food and supply to widows who don't have support, and evidently there's a bunch of them. And so they said, well, you know, it's, it's not appropriate for us to shop, stop sharing this life-changing gospel in order just to feed box lunches to widows. 
And so it's not unimportant. So let's appoint seven men of honest report full of the Holy Spirit and power that we may appoint over this business. They choose out seven. They, they, they begin to serve in natural ways, serve in natural ways. And guess what happens to the deacons? The deacons in their spare time go to cities, preach the gospel, lead in citywide revivals and see miracles. They were ordained to serve lunch. And in their spare time did miracles. That every time there's a need, even in the natural, please understand, the Bible says about this particular moment, it says the word of God spread as a result of this. The word of God spread. The number of the disciples were, were multiplied in uh, Jerusalem greatly, rapidly, and the number of the priests were even added to the face. I'm telling you, there was a magnificent move of God came because there was a delegated authority that was moved into the realm of believers. Doesn't have to be somebody super special. It can be just people like us. And so, the so touching the natural need produced a supernatural response. Let me say it again. Touching the natural need produced a supernatural response. Or the story in Acts chapter number 10. Again, God knows where people are. When the cry of their heart comes out, God responds. And there's a guy, so, so understand, until chapter 10 of the book of Acts, the church hasn't grown outside of the borders of the Jewish people. In other words, it stayed in Jerusalem. And so Peter is down at a place called Joppa, which is next to the seacoast in Galilee and so forth. And so in any case, he's, he's down there. He decides to take a nap one day. And then across town, there's a centurion, Roman centurion, a Gentile of the Italian band, the Bible calls him, and so forth. And so he's down there eating spaghetti, doing some kind of something or other. <laughs> and so anyway, he's down, and, and he's calling upon the name of the Lord. And the Bible says an angel of the Lord showed up. Come on, how many of you know that's a big day? Banner day. The angel of the Lord shows up and says to, the, to Cornelius, he said, your, your almsgiving, your giving, your generosity, and your prayers has come before God as a memorial. He said, now, send to Simon's house, Simon the Tanner, send to Simon's house, for there's one there named Peter who will bring to you the word of truth, word of life. And so he takes his servants and he sends them down there. And now Peter at the same time is having a dream. He's on the top of the house, he's taking a nap, and suddenly he gets this dream and he sees a sheet full of unclean animals. In other words, they're, they're not kosher, you don't eat pig, and there's probably pigs in the blanket. Oh. Right there. Brumpa. Be here all week. So, <laughs> sorry. I cracked myself up. So he has this moment, and, and God says to him, what, what God calls clean, don't you call unclean. And he was making a point that the gospel was ready to make a transition into the realm of Gentiles, which was not hitting the brain of a Jewish guy, because there was so much idolatry, so much wickedness, so much so, so many generation after generation of wickedness and came in opposition and brutal treatment of the people of Israel and, and so forth. And they're thinking, man, these, these folks are all going to hell and they should go to hell and blah, blah, blah. That's kind of the common thought pattern here. Man, there's all kinds of people in the city right now that folks in church think that way. Grace saved them, but then they think law is going to help them. Well, God unpacks that whole idea of grace and then the angel of the Lord shows up and says, and God speaks to Peter and says, there's going to come a knock at the door. Go where they're going. In other words, don't be afraid. And he's already showed them that God's pulled the, the unclean title off of those people and God wants to save them. Amen. Promise made to Abraham back before the law ever showed up that God would make him a, a blessing to many nations. And so here it is. And so Peter gets the knock at the door. He goes to Cornelius' house. He starts to preach the gospel at Cornelius' house. And this is what he says. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Yes. That's right. And he loves the down and outers as much as the up and outers. <laughs> and so he preaches the gospel in the middle of his message. God pours the spirit of God out on this whole crowd and a bunch of Italians speaking in an unknown tongue. And they said, well, what does hinder us to be, for these people to be water baptized, seeing that God's poured his spirit out upon them just like he did us? Yeah. 
And all of a sudden, the Gentile world experiences breakthrough and revival because when people have a need and they call upon God, God sends people. Here's my question. If an angel could come and talk to and give specific direction to a guy named Cornelius, why didn't the angel just tell him the gospel? Just wondering. It would seem like that would be impactful. Had an experience, a supernatural being came and told me to go ask for Peter. Why didn't he just tell him about Jesus right there? Because when the world has a need, God sends his people. That's the way it works. That when God has a need, he sends a people. Come and help us. Come to Macedonia and help us. See, the message needs a model because it's not just an idea. It's a people. It's what God can do in real people, real time, in the circumstance that all of us are dealing with, be it 2020, 2021, or 2022. Whatever comes, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the living word. Matter of fact, God just didn't send us well wishes from heaven. He sent a son to be among us. And the world had a need, and it needed a Savior, and so God sent a son. The Bible calls him in 1 John, or John chapter number 1, the word made flesh. Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That when the world has a need, God sends a people or a person. And there's a famine of goodness and hope in the world that's around us right now. That people are, whew, they don't trust. People need truth in action or they won't. Trust. It's not theology that changes lives, it's people that are different. You show them different and they'll believe. If you show them criticism, they'll probably hope it's not catching and run out of the room. And so it's harder to protect someone's understanding from truth if a living epistle is standing right in front of them. That's what the Bible calls you, you know. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says that you're living epistles, known and read of all men, that people may never read the Bible, but they'll read the word of God that manifests in your life. And there's hope because when you show up, the atmosphere of a room changes. The neighborhood changes when we show up. God uses people. Again, why didn't he send angel? Because you're here. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And whenever we who feel very unqualified and very under-resourced begin to get together, suddenly God begins to do miracles. Like in Acts chapter 6 or... Throughout the word of God, God takes a little boy's lunch in John chapter number six, and there's a multitude of people standing around all over the place, and, and they've been listening to Jesus preach, and Jesus looks at his disciples and said, feed them. And they said, well, they ain't a Kroger close. That's probably a living Bible, I think. <laughs> and, and they said, he said, well, what do you have? See, God's not, he's not asking you for what you don't have. And you look at what you have and you say it's not enough. He says, perfect, it's more than enough. But in order for it to be more than enough, it can't stay in your hands. It's got to get in his. And so he looked at a little boy one day, kind of like the Macedonian call. He looked at that little boy and said, little boy, I need your help. Can I have your lunch? Maybe that little boy, maybe he heard this, and I don't know, this is just speculation on my part, but maybe he said, you know, if you'll help me with your lunch, you're going to be a witness to a miracle. And because of your generosity, people are going to talk about you, son, for thousands of years because of this day. And he witnessed a miracle of provision that God would take his lunch and feed a multitude. It's estimated somewhere around 20,000 people ate out of that little boy's lunch. And when it, was, when it was all over, they took up 12 baskets of what remained. It's always more than enough. I don't know what happened to the 12 baskets. I imagine that little boy went home with them. <laughs> that which a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Mom, look what happened to my lunch. <laughs> See, whenever God gets receives from us what we consider to be not enough. He makes it and multiplies it into more than enough. And it's just what he does. 
You know, in Matthew chapter number 9, Jesus, the Bible says, looked up and he saw the multitude and he was moved with compassion. And this is the Bible, what, what it says. He saw that the people were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest. And that's the way kingdom builders see. We hear and feel the compassion of the Lord and and I'm going to step forward, and I may only have a little boy's lunch, but right now I'm going to give it to Jesus and watch what he does with it. Amen. And it's that sort of an idea. I want you to understand that the heart of Jesus sees like people, other people don't see. He said the Bible says that they were a multitude of people, and he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were scattered and weary, like sheep having no shepherd. Isn't that just like today? People are on Facebook looking for a shepherd. Come on, they found a skunk or two, but they didn't find a shepherd. That's a stinker, if you don't know. I've seen a few of those stinkers. That's the reason why I don't go there. But understand what Christine Kane said, I believe, is prophetic for the entire body of Christ. That, that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. It's just those who are willing to go, willing to give their lunch, willing to do whatever in order for, if, it leaves, if it's leaving my fishing nets, and nobody really knows me except the people that I sell fish to, but, but the fact that the whole world is going to know my name because I had an encounter with Jesus, or the whole world's going to know who I am for generations to come because I met the Jesus on the road to Damascus and he changed everything about my life. And I was willing to just step forward and testify. Just tell him what God did for me. And watched him do it time and time and time again. And that's what God does. When the disciples said yes to the call of Jesus, just come and help me. Jesus was in, I, I need your help. And what he did for those guys was he made them bigger on the inside. And it changed the way they lived on the outside. What God does for you on the inside changes your outside. And that's... Maybe a part of the reason why folks don't go to church today is because folks told them they went to church, but they look just like everybody else. And the whole thing just starts with this beautiful thing. Come, I need your help. Peter, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Let's shorten that a little bit. He tells Simon, he says, follow me and I will make you. Follow me, and I'm going to make you. Maybe the appropriate term in this context is, I'm going to remake you. I'm going to rewrite the script. If this was a movie, the music would change because something good, cool is about to happen. It's the Jesus encounter of life that changes who we are. And Jesus saw the dry and the scattered, the vulnerable multitudes, and was moved with compassion. People just like us and he began to reach out. And you know what he did? He began to send laborers more and more. He sent 12. And then, then he sent 70. Jesus probably said to the 70, I need your help. There's a multitude out there and 12 is not enough. And so let's get another 70 involved. And engagement began. And suddenly they came back rejoicing that even the devils were subject unto him in his name. And Jesus said, well, you know, it's supposed to work. I'm not sending you out there just to try. I'm sending you out there to do it. And don't rejoice that the devil's a subject unto you, but rejoice rather that your name's written in the book. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And just understand, I'm making you a kingdom builder, but you're a part of the kingdom, and so welcome to the embrace of God. And in that embrace, feel the compassion of God towards the scattered multitudes, and hear him say, come and help me. I need your help. See, whatever you give the Lord, he multiplies. And so whatever, whatever that we offer to the Lord, whether it's in a, an impact offering today or whether it's just giving our lives, and maybe, and hopefully it's both, that, Lord, I'm accessible. If you tell me to go somewhere, I'm going. I'm committed. Because when you come out of a place like Paul came from and see what he sees, you can't help but engage. When you see a guy like Peter who comes out of the boredom of fishing and not all that successful because he went out in the night of his calling or the day of his calling and he didn't catch anything. So he wasn't even good at it. 
Uh, it was a setup because God was going to rearrange his life and send him in a brand new direction. Is it all right for me to tell you that he did the same thing for a guy like me? And I was thrilled for the encounter. Never dreamed, never dreamed in my young life that I would ever stand on one of these. Never. Neither did anyone else for that matter. But I want you to know that the book of Acts is filled with people with our story and became bigger on the inside because of what Jesus did. And because of that, made a contribution to the kingdom of God and to the advancement of the kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ so that the world now today is a different place than it would have been without the gospel. So different. In the book of Acts, I'm telling you, generosity was budding out of everywhere and out of that amazing generosity, God gave a revival just because they heard Jesus say, I need your help. Come and help me. And they answered the call. And they went to the field. Let me just tell you something about money. Money's not important to God. God can pull it out of a fish's mouth. People are the most valuable thing in the world. Because the same amount of gold that's ever been on this planet is still here. But the treasure of life tucked a glory in earthen vessels have advanced out of time and eternity and have gone into heaven today. And I can tell you they're worth more than anything. And it testifies today that God's not so much interested in money as he is people. And if we'll, we'll use the money that we have, offer him our lunch, that he'll take it and he'll do magnificent things with it. He'll change an entire culture of people. Listen, I don't know what other folks are doing. They may be here in the B Bithynian call taking the gospel to the suburbs. Who in their right mind takes the gospel to East 3rd Street? Those who hear a Macedonian call. Those who hear him say, I need your help. There's a whole group of people down here, and there's thousands of them that have never known anything but hatred or strife or discord or dysfunction. There's a whole group of people. And by the way, there's normal people in these days in Ohio, amen. But there's all kinds of folks that have been pulled down, and they've been pulled down for so long that they don't know what up looks like. And I can hear them. Jesus sees them as a multitude of people scattered and weary because they don't have a shepherd. And I'll tell you what we can do. We can go. Immediately, Jesus' response was to send 12 and then to send 70. And I'm here to tell you, he's got more than 82 to send today. It's a whole group of people that have decided we're going to build a dream center. And that dream center is going to make a difference in the lives of thousands of people. Yes. Thousands of them. There's people in Dayton, Ohio that I'm their pastor and they don't even know it yet but I'm coming. I say we're coming. As people, these lives are being changed and transformed. Your generosity has made it happen right now. Do you know that you're two and a quarter million dollars into the Dream Center right now? Say, well, we still need a million bucks. Look over your shoulder and the little boy's lunch testifies, doesn't it? That God's got more than enough. He just needs people to see and feel the compassion of God to offer their lunch to Jesus and say, okay, let's go. Let's make, let's make change happen. And I'm telling you right now, you're sitting on a strategic time, a day of impact. You're kingdom builders. That's who God called us all together to be. I suppose the reason why you would come to this church is because you have that heart. Because I think maybe the people that don't have that heart, I'd drive you crazy. Because I can tell you this call wakes me up every morning and puts me to bed every night. And I believe that God wants to do something absolutely 
I mean, I believe there are people be flying into this city to find out how in the world Dayton, Ohio changed the way that it has. And you know what they're going to say? A kingdom builder came and found me. And my life has changed forever. Just begin to dream that it's possible. The message has got to have a model or people will not believe. And so we have to show up. We can't just wish them good things and think good thoughts. And we can't, you can't just send money at it. That's what the government does. That's the reason why things never get better. They need a message. And the message is always wrapped in a package. And it looks just like you. And so God didn't just give me a dream. He gave us one. Come and help us. Come to Macedonia and help us. And that's, I believe, the strategic moment that we're in right now. And it's just going to redefine who we are as a people, as you and, and I as individuals. It's going to transform how we think about the world around us. This world can be a very selfish place. But God is always reaching out to the scattered multitudes. And today, I'm just asking you, pray. Whatever God says to you to do in contribution, Jackie and I have decided to give to something that we actually feel leaving our hands. It's a substantial gift that we've chosen to give. And I know God's speaking to you, and I'm going to ask you, what do you have in your hand? And what's the heart of God saying to you? And just respond to what, what the Lord's saying to you. Can you hear him saying, I need your help? And then respond. And watch what God does. I'll also mention too, we've got a table out there. We've got about 6,000, 7,000 square foot of walls to paint because they're built and ready for paint. And so if you can run a paint roller, I don't suppose that requires schooling and training. Well, we want you to come and we want you to help us clean the floors and all that kind of stuff because we're ready to put flooring down. We only got 35,000 square foot of it to do. Big job. Never forget while you're preparing your offerings today. Thousand is spelled T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D <laughs> for your check. Listen, I'm, I'm trusting God and I'm not afraid to tell you I need a half a million dollars today. Well, that's so much. Yeah, if you got to give it. But you spread that out over all of us. God's good. Some have the capacity to write that check right now, just one, and meet that need. It's not the size of the gift. It's just obeying God. If it's a little boy's lunch, it will be multiplied to meet the needs. And so I don't have a care about it. Half a million dollar need and you don't have a care about it? Not a care. Because I'm already two and a quarter million in and God did the whole thing. You, you, you did the whole thing. I've had people that aren't even saved give me money for this. Lots of them. I'm not a Christian, but I love what you're doing here. It's got the attention of a lot of people. I just want you to know when compassion suddenly finds legs and feet and smiling faces and hands and generosity and, and a warm hug and a gesture of, I got coats and blankets for you, something begins to happen in a city that's not happening already. And I believe that God wants to do something great. So there's a way for you to give. The, the ways are on the They'll put this up on the screen. I don't know. Yes, there they are. And for those of you online as well, you can participate with us as well. Let me pray over this morning's offering. And all of this offering goes to Dream Center. And so on the pull-down menu, there's an opportunity for you to give just to the Impact Sunday. And so you can do the pull-down on, on our app, and you can give that way if you'd like. I want to pray for you, but I want you to bow your heads with me because you may be in the room today, and you say, Pastor, I came with my own need. I'm a part of the scattered multitude that needs God's help. And I want you to know he's as close as the mention of his name, my dear friend. 
And your life can be like mine. It can transform. But at some point, you just got to open up your heart to the master and let him become the Lord of who you are. And that means you got to surrender the chief seat of your heart to him. And when he comes and you begin to learn from him and you draw close to him and watch how he responds to life, your life will be changed just like mine, just like so many sitting in this room or watching online right now. And so today can be that day for you. And I want to pray for you today. Before we take up this offering, we pray over this morning's impact offering. I want to pray for you. If you're in the room today and you say, Pastor, I've never asked Jesus into my life. I didn't know I was supposed to. Or maybe you'd say, Pastor, I need to hit the reset button in my life. Can God do that for me? Yes, he can. It's called being born again. John chapter 3, verse 3. And so today, if you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, or you've never entered in, into the family of God through asking Jesus Christ and crowning him as the King and Lord of who you are, allowing his grace to forgive your past and to launch you into a freedom and a future that you never dreamed possible, it took a Savior to do that for you, one who could rise from the dead, and he'll put resurrection in your life as well. And he's as close as a mention of his name, and he's not going to barge the door down. But you can call upon his name, and he will save you, and he'll do it right now. You just got to say yes. So if you're in this room today, and you say, Pastor Pat, don't leave me out of that prayer. I know I need God in my life. I need his forgiving grace. Can he do it for me? He can. And you're one prayer away from making Jesus Christ the Lord of who you are. And so if you're in the room today or you're watching online, you say, Pastor Pat, don't leave me out of that prayer. Pray for me today. If that's you, wherever you are, I want you to lift your hand right now. Just lift your hand. That's me. I need God in my life, Pastor Pat. God bless you today. Yeah, anybody? I see you. God bless you. Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? I see you, sir. God bless you. Amen. What a joy. And those of you online, there's a way that you can raise your hand as well. It's called the raise a hand button. It's right on your computer screen there. Just touch that. Saying, Pastor, I'm in. I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life, and I'm in. And I want you to pray with me this prayer right out loud, all of us together. Let's pray this prayer with those who have raised their hands and those of us online. Pray this with me right out loud. Dear God in heaven, I come in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world, who came and died for me and then rose from the dead. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be the Lord of who I am. Please teach me what that means. I repent for my sin, and I give my life to you. I know I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Come on, can we give God a good amen this morning? Woo, hallelujah. Man, Lord's so good. And now, let me, let me pray over this morning's offering. You know I love you, and, and I don't want something from you. I want something for you. To be a kingdom builder is the greatest privilege of my life. I'm inviting you into that. To be a kingdom builder, that's it. And not to just do it today. Man, we're going to turn loose on the population and change the atmosphere of every room we walk into. Why? Because I brought the kingdom of God with me. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the amazing generosity, very much like the book of Acts in chapter 2, that they gave and had all things common. They loved each other. They gathered in small groups, and you added to the church every day such as should be saved. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that impact offering and our impact of your compassion upon our lives, Father God, launches us into a revival of Acts 2 lifestyle so that all of us can see a city come to God. Now, people don't know we're coming, but Lord, they'll find out soon because we'll sure show up. And Lord, I thank you that you'll take what we give you and you'll multiply it so that we can give and give again in a cycle of prosperity so that, Lord God, we can afford to be generous time and time again. And Lord, to you be all the thanks and all the praise. Be glorified in Dayton, Ohio, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you this morning. Pastor Joel, come on. God bless you, everybody. Hey, thanks for joining us here at Living Word Church Online. If you made the choice to follow Jesus today, congratulations. You just made the best decision of your life. But we don't want you to walk this new path alone. God designed us to be in a community and to help each other. So we want to help you grow in your new faith. 
Click the raise hand button in your chat box and we'll make sure to help you with your next steps. Or if you're joining us on Facebook, you can text HOPE to the number on your screen. It's God's job to save you, but He's trusted us to help guide you in this brand new faith journey. Here at Living Word, we're all about taking next steps. And whether you're a brand new Christian or you've been following Jesus for a long time, we all have a next step we can take. We want to encourage you to take your next step, no matter what it is. If you'd like to find a group of people to help you grow in your faith, your next step is to join a life group. Life is better when we spend it together. Or maybe you feel like joining our dream team and serving others. Lifetrack would be your next step. Lifetrack is our way to help you find the path from potential to purpose and make a difference in the world around you. Or it could be that your next step is to trust God with your finances. All the ways you can partner with us in growing God's kingdom are on your screens now. All of these next steps and more can be found in our mobile church app. Download it today by texting DLWC app to 77977. We hope you take what God spoke to you today into the coming week and make a difference in your world. We love you, we're for you, and we'll see you next Sunday right here at Church Online.